the 8th United States Air Force, taking off from airdromes in England, continue their round-the-clock devastation of war plants in Nazi Germany. In broad daylight, mighty squadrons roar across the North Sea. Over Hamburg, Germany's principal seaport and number one war center, tons of bombs rain from the skies. Aerial photographs show the results. Seven square miles of Hamburg's war industries, docks, military installations, flattened and in ruins. Water mains, gas and electric plants destroyed. Hamburg as a war center, a base for submarines, is virtually wiped off the map. home, machine gunners blast enemy fighter planes from the skies. The return of the squadrons. Jagged, gaping holes in many a bomber testify to the intensity of the futile Nazi defense. Even as a wounded Yankee gunner is borne from his ship, RAF ground crews are making ready night raiders to continue the assault. From more than 40 airdromes, 800 giant bombers, Wellingtons, Liberators, Lancasters, forts, take off to complete the destruction of the vital Nazi seaport. Again the signal on target. And the city of Hamburg is fired by more bombs than fell on London in the 11 worst months of the Nazi air attacks. for launching the new U.S. aircraft carrier Wasp. Among those invited to attend the ceremony are sons of naval officers who went down fighting with the old Wasp off Guadalcanal. And the sponsor almost misses the boat. Now it's official, and the seventh warship in the history of the United States to bear the name Wasp slides down the ways to join the fleet. America's newest flat top will soon be in action against the Axis. Thirty minutes from New York's Times Square, the finest trotting horses in America parade to the post for the traditional classic of harness racing. The Hamiltonian, it's called. A fast-moving, high-stepping contest worth thousands of dollars to the winner. Most of the drivers are more than 60 years of age and veterans at this sort of racing. First time around, number three, Volo Song, the favorite, breaks away and loses the race. But it takes two out of three victories to decide the winner. And now the favorite is back in the running. The slow motion camera recording the thrilling form and rhythmic precision of the famous American trotter. finish of the deciding race. The crowd roars as Volo Song steps out in front. For 70-year-old Ben White at the reins, it's his fourth victory, the only four-time winner of America's greatest trotting classic. Canada, scene of the sixth historic meeting between President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill. With them, the Dominion Premier and highest-ranking British and American staff officers. 
Admiral King and General Marshall, United States Army Chief of Staff. The United Nations war leaders have said their decisions would become known on the battlefields in future action against the Axis. Significant is the arrival of China's Foreign Secretary, Dr. T.V. Sung, who comes to the conference table representing Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. Premier King welcomes the Chinese envoy to Canada. Even as Britain's Prime Minister and President Roosevelt warn the Axis to surrender now, the High Command announces new offensives on all fronts. Names Lord Louis Mountbatten at left, Supreme Allied Commander in Southeast Asia. Britain's Air Marshal Sir Charles Portal and American Air Chief General Henry Arnold at left declare that new day and night air assaults on Berlin are already in progress. Plans for bringing effective aid to China. Plans for decisive blows that will end the war in the East. Islands north of Australia, New Guinea, New Britain, vitally important Munda on New Georgia Island, come dramatic official films of the Allies' great sea and air offensive against the Japanese in the South Pacific. Planes over Kahili sight and bomb a Japanese cruiser. B-24s swarm over the Jap base at Ley on New Britain, breaking shore positions again and again. Enemy landing barges bringing reinforcements are machine gunned out of the water. the shores of Munda, the bombers see American destroyers move in and bombard the big Japanese airfield on this vitally important island. The smoking shoreline reveals the effects of the naval bombardment. Working with precision and exactness in a coordinated attack, the destroyers now move out as medium and heavy bombers soften the way for the Allied troops advancing on land. bomber unloading a never-ending cargo of death upon the enemy. Perhaps this is what President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill meant when they said decisions reached at the Quebec conference would have a far-reaching effect in the war against Japan. Here is Allied air power already smashing the outlying defenses of the Japanese Empire. 